Hello comrades, today we're going to be responding to some grade A cringe in the form of Vosh's pro-NATO propaganda. Today I will be joined by Gingeros. We will be going over how Vosh not only has no idea what he is talking about, but the fact that despite any lep service he might pay to being a leftist or anti-imperialist, that all of his rhetoric is utterly meaningless when he equates black and indigenous liberation with the Holocaust and actively aligns himself with NATO and the U.S. State Departments. The U.S. pulling out of Afghanistan? Bad idea, says Vosh. We just need to stay there a bit longer. We just need to occupy another sovereign nation for a little while longer, make sure that our puppet government can maintain itself without utterly collapsing, and then slowly leave. Even though the Taliban takeover was inevitable, be it if we left now, ten years from today, or ten years ago. Russia's arrival imperialist power? We just need to starve them to death with genocidal sanctions. Let their people suffer and toil and squalor, punishing the Russian people directly for the actions of their own undemocratic government. Then, after we've murdered several million of them through starvation and preventable illness, see if they want to play ball and capitulate to our imperialist interests. And yes, I'm aware that he's backpedaled on this statement, and says that he only wants to sanction the oligarchs, but regardless, given the amount of fear-mongering that he's done in the past against the swarthy Asiatic hordes, given some of the more overtly racist comments that he's made, accusing non-compete of simping for the wussy for defending his own wife from the onslaught of targeted harassments that Vosh has signaled his audience to do towards them, it's pretty obvious that this guy has some pretty Orientalist sentiments alongside his Western chauvinism, anti-communism, and American exceptionalism. Here's the difference between liberal and leftist analysis of imperialism. To the liberal, some interventions are good, some are justified, and the problem isn't imperialism itself. The problem is that we aren't playing the world police job in a competent way. And that if we could just reform it, you know, maybe democratize NATO here, add a few more gay drone pilots there, cooperatize the U.S. government there, we could have a kind of beneficial social imperialism where we can trample on other nations' self-determination and crush those beneath us in a way that's not as offensive to our moral sensibilities. Let better optics, if you will. This is the mindset of Vosh. In this way, he is very much to the right of Joseph fucking Biden being more of an interventionist and American exceptionalist and Western chauvinist than Sleepy Joe has thus far. Look at this unbelievably cringe tweet, actively defending and supporting NATO in a little joke, making his case for what he deems anarcho-NATOism. If only it was an actual joke with the punchline, that was actually funny. However, when you consider his recent commentary on the subject, it's pretty clear how unapologetically unironic he's actually being. This right here is the central fundamental problem with Vosh, and how his brand of leftism is little more than an active roadblock to actual socialist consciousness, because rather than opposing the institution of imperialism, he makes it out to be something that we should support and try to reform for the better, as the swarthy Asiatic hordes are just around the corner, when the truth is that there is no good imperialism and there is no reforming it, because the interests of the Western leadership is never in line with the interests of that of the international proletariat. It is always within the interests of the transnational bourgeoisie to crush the interests of the international proletariat time and time again, as history has repeatedly shown. And yet, through Vosch's anarcho-liberal Chomskyite analysis, this is not the case. Hell, if anything, Vosch is to the right of Noam Chomsky on this, because at least Chomsky understands how Russia is being backed into a corner and threatened geopolitically by the West, and that if it weren't for the Western-backed Euromaidan uprising in 2013, that Russia would have likely never had to invade Ukraine in the first place. Uh, for Ukraine to be taken into NATO, which is what is repeatedly threatened, would be a very serious threat to the Russian security. There are serious confrontations between Russia and the United States. And once again, are they on the Mexican border, the Canadian border? No, they're on the Russian border. In fact, right at the point of the uh, traditional invasion route uh, through which Russia has been virtually destroyed uh, several times in the past century. So Russia has been provoked? Well, what happened? NATO instantly moved to East Germany. Then Clinton came along, uh, expanded NATO right to the borders of Russia. Now there are uh, the, Russia, the new Ukrainian government, the government after the overthrow of the preceding one, uh, the parliament voted uh, I think 300 to 8 or something like that, to move to join NATO. 
<laughs> but you can understand why they would want to join NATO. You can see why Petro Poroshenko's government would probably see that it's protecting his country. No, no, it's not protect. Crimea was taken away after the overthrow of the government. Imagine being to the right of Chomsky Hunk while claiming to be on the left. You guys ready for some quality cancer? I am pro-NATO now. I am. I legitimately feel like NATO in its existence really doesn't do anything to materially suppress uh, the cause for socialists worldwide today. And I feel like the insistence on hyper fixating on NATO from the perspective of a leftist has been a psyop in favor of the Russian government. I really. OK, so time for me to explain why exactly Vosh is absolutely wrong about absolutely everything. NATO was created after World War II as a counter to the Soviet Union and the Soviet occupied Eastern Europe. It was a military alliance that was created in 1948, immediately after World War II, uh, explicitly as an anti-communist organization. You had members, former members of the SS, high-ranking ex-Nazis that were integrated into NATO as officers and uh, high-ranking officials within it, as well as the UN. On top of that, you also had a number of Nazis, which were, of course, absorbed into Western intelligentsia. You had the fucking Gestapo that basically became the the BND. Like West German intelligence didn't just absorb the Gestapo; it basically was the Gestapo. So uh, yeah, no, uh, it was originally created as a counter to the to the Soviets and eventually the Warsaw Pact. The Warsaw Pact was created as a counter to NATO, and uh, throughout the course of the Cold War, uh, the NATO was basically their military alliance. It was an anti-communist military alliance that has been routinely bombing countries for decades, along with the United States. And uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, they just moved in to absorb Eastern Europe. But anyways. Yep. And just a friendly reminder, internal documentation has shown that the collective of Western leadership in 1990 explicitly gave loads of reassurance to the Russian leadership that there would be no reason for NATO to expand eastward with the end of the Cold War, and that Russian geopolitical security would be respected. But as we have seen, this has not been the case, and the West has only continued to pressure Russia and then back them into a corner geopolitically since the fall of the USSR and the end of the Cold War. Documents on screen very much related. It, so that and, was and, the reason, that's literally the reason why NATO was created. It was created explicitly as an anti-socialist, anti-Soviet org. And, and now it's basically just there for... Um the money laundering through the uh, military industrial complex. Uh, yeah. For example, um, now it, uh, all NATO countries, I believe are required to, to, to spend it at least 2% of their um, economy on uh, military spending. And ever since Russia invaded Ukraine, we have been seeing every country in fucking Europe just say, you know what, yeah. we're gonna rearm. We're gonna just start like, you know, spending a shitload on money and Guess what that does? It saps from social spending. I really do. I genuinely believe that, and I don't care anymore. All the imperialist action that NATO has taken uh, uh, has, is something that could have effortlessly been done by other just European or American military actions without the help of NATO. NATO itself doesn't facilitate anything other than protecting countries in Eastern Europe from aggression from Russia. NATO does not exist to protect the countries of Eastern Europe from Russia. On the contrary, it is thanks to Russia historically that the Eastern European countries even have their national sovereignty back in the first place. As for one, after the downfall of the Russian Empire, the Soviets would go on to do literal land back, giving regions like Ukraine their own territories. And for two, it is once again thanks to the Soviets that the Eastern European countries were pulled out from the medieval era and rescued from their own fascist governments. Not only that, but after World War II, it was the Soviets that would subsidize them and help them develop their own self-sufficient economies. And now that communism has been dismantled, most of Eastern Europe has been transformed into neoliberal anti-communist vassal states, rampant with fascism and wholly economically dependent on the EU. Okay, so this is the equivalent of arguing that um, there's a Pepsi... Pl I, I live in a third world country, and a Pepsi plant has been built upstream, up the river where my village is at. And this Pepsi plant is polluting the fuck out of my stream. Myself and everyone in the, in, the, in the village is contracting cancer. We're getting cancer. There's lead in our water, getting lead po poisoning. People are dying earlier and earlier. 
And uh, Vosh comes along and he's like, well, yeah, they may be polluting your water, but if that Pepsi plant wasn't there, have you considered that it, it would be a Coca-Cola plant there instead? Or a Sprite plant or a Martin Mountain Dew plant? It was going to happen anyways. And, you know, they're producing a really good products. You know, people like their soda. So just get the fuck. Like, dude, this is straight up a, a fucking imperialist apologetics. Like, this dude's like straight up a fucking pro imperialist chill. Like, this yeah. is like bullshit. Like, okay, if America didn't if america didn't try to genocide off the natives maybe some other european empire would have that uh, that doesn't change the fact that like okay that's a dumbass hypothetical we should still oppose it because it is a wing of imperialism and it is imperialism which we must oppose yeah 100 percent. i will take it yeah i don't think nato does that much at all really except for prevent and this uh, to, to, to my knowledge right now what nato does presently is prevent russian imperialism that seems to be the thing it's doing just to make you a social democrat then and quit masking socialist so you don't even know what is what does socialism have to do with this you don't even know you don't know what these terms mean you yeah no that, that's just straight up bullshit nato's been the one doing military buildup and encroaching closer and closer on russia's border not the other way around russia hasn't really i mean up until now russia has not been fucking uh going around just conquering like directly intervening, conquering and absorbing territories and threatening countries left and left, right, militarily. The reason why it went into Ukraine is because it was threatened, backed into a corner and pushed into doing so. It's it's so unbelievably incorrect. Like seriously, the dude is just such, he's, he's Russia phobic. Like, well, we need NATO to protect us from the big, bad, barbaric Asiatic hordes. Like it's straight up xenophobia and Russia phobia. Is there really any difference between this asshole and the neocon? Just saying. And this is the psyop. To you, socialism is when things sound anti-American. That's what it is to you. That's why there are so many online leftists who are hand-wringing in op opposition to Russia, when Russia is more capitalist and fascist than the United States by almost... The, another stupid point. Like, this dude is just a non-stop bad takes factory. He's a, he's a bad takes factory. Like, that's not even, like, remotely fucking true. Again... Russia is not the one going around starving poor nations to death with genocidal sanctions. They're not the ones going around overthrowing sovereign governments and coups. They're not the ones militarily invading left and right. Yeah, they're an imperialist power. But like this is like, you know, this is like being covered from head to toe in mud and just completely covered in like a one inch thick layer of mud while pointing to the person over there who's got like a tiny stain of mud on their t-shirt and being like you're covered in mud you know it, it's, it, so it's stupid it's and what about ism it, it is it's pure what about ism and like why i just it's it it, it it astounds me like how people take this dude seriously like people really think this guy knows anything about anything like he's just a pro-imperialist pro-nato shill yeah Every imaginable metric, it is farther from socialism than the U.S. Russia makes the U.S. in comparison look socialist. This is not a high bar to pass, okay? Um, they managed to fall below it nonetheless. But that's not my fault. Acknowledging that doesn't make me an imperialist. Uh, it is simply a statement of fact. Basically, I have yet to see anyone provide for me a convincing argument. What exactly does NATO do that is imperialism? Please let me know. No. Uh, oh, man. I can't understand. Right a few examples. Serbia... Dude, aren't there like uh, several? Libya. There are several countries that the U.S. and NATO are like bombing at this time. Libya, Libya, Yugoslavia. Those are just the ones that immediately come to mind. Those are just ones that immediately come to mind. Um, let's see. Let's do 1999 present. So Serbia and Kosovo since 1999, and then we have Bosnia. So yeah, Bosnia, Herzegovina. Then we have their operations in Macedonia, U.S. airspace, Mediterranean Sea, Afghanistan, Turkey, Pakistan. Oh, look at all these countries. I mean, NATO isn't the primary arm, primary military arm of imperialism. Uh, that would actually be the United States. The U.S. is the one that does the bulk of it. NATO was created as a reaction, as a bulwark against the Soviet Union in Europe. That's the reason why it exists. But otherwise, yeah, no, it routinely bombs countries as well. Don't kid yourself. Oh, you know, you've, you've, 
in, like like fucking Switzerland and 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 uh, Germany. Like they're they're in the process of pumping like billions of dollars of arms into Ukraine as we speak. Uh, Switzerland arms dictators. Uh, same with Sweden. Like these countries fucking export a shit ton of guns and back and provide support to reactionary governments all over the goddamn globe. They are facilitating to make the world an objectively worse place. They are backing these fucking anti-communist, far-right, right-wing dictators that are explicitly anti-socialist and anti-communist, Bosch. Same with the yeah. United States. NATO does it too. They both do it. It's just NATO less so. So, like, how can you honestly sit here and be like, oh, uh, oh, NATO, NATO doesn't hinder socialism at all? This is the dumbest fucking take. Like, fucking seriously. Yugoslavia. Libya. Okay, fine. Well, the European powers would have been incentivized to do that either way. The NATO alliance wasn't the thing that allowed that to happen. It was just framed through that. It seems a little dumb, 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 dumb. Again, back to my original point. Oh, there's a coke plant that's polluting the water, poisoning all the villagers in my hometown. Uh, again, well, if it wasn't a coke plant, it would be a Pepsi plant. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, what kind of fucking ridiculous fucking point is that? Like, yeah. yeah, it doesn't change the fact that it's still happening and it's still being done. NATO could be called Kurgo Blitz for all I cared. It could be called window glasses. It could be called lamp shading. It doesn't matter what they fucking call it. It's the institution and it still needs to be frustrated and opposed. This is a complete and total non-argument. And like uh, him harping about anti-Americanism, being like, oh, uh, it just sounds like a vessel, like for people to be anti-American. Uh, anti-Americanism is based. America is, for all intents and purposes, the great Satan. Guys, this is what an American exceptionalist and a national chauvinist looks like. Yep. Odd to frame it that way. Hassan was talking about NATO. This is the level of brain rot I think people are on right now. Hassan was talking about NATO as though NATO invades countries to make them a part of NATO, like it's an occupying force. And his audience is many times larger than mine. So I think a lot of people, that's what they think of. Like, well, what, is, what does NATO do? Well, NATO invades countries and bullies them. Well, no, you, you, you petition to join NATO. You, what is, what, what, what? Yeah, no, not how it works at all. Not how it works at all. Um, NATO absolutely fucking bullies countries, um, either directly or indirectly into joining it. Like, because you don't really have a choice. You either kowtow and get in line with the Western hegemon or Western colonial bloc and submit to austerity and economic restructuring and, or you don't do that and uh, they just sanction you and they just make life very difficult for you so i mean there isn't really much of a meaningless choice like uh like all the eastern Euro european countries were in fucking shambles many of them opted to get absorbed into nato because they needed some kind of economic support i mean shit, dude i mean you've got like poland and a couple other countries like Estonia that are just propped up as fucking Western client states, more or less. Just they, they're just vassals to the EU now. So like, it's just yeah. so stupid. Like, oh, like, dude, they absolutely do it. It's through combination of foreign direct investment, other types of investment. Uh, the reason why they fucking went in and bombed Gaddafi is because he threatened their hegemony. He was trying to establish in a uh, reserve currency for Africa, and he wasn't willing to play ball. He wasn't willing to kowtow. So we ended up destroying his regime. We just went in there. We had NATO bombs murder a bunch of people, uh, plummet the country into chaos, and uh, we fucking had Gaddafi raped to death with a knife by uh, Western assassins. So yeah, no, no, dude. He's a fucking, like, imagine thinking this guy's a socialist in any meaningful capacity. What does that, what does that do? The argument I keep running into is that NATO is basically America. Uh, okay, the powers in Europe are aligned with America anyway. If they want to join NATO, they're already in our geopolitical hegemon. If, if you say, like, spreading the interest of NATO is part of the U.S. geopolitical hegemon, then okay. If they want to be a part of it, that's part of their national sovereignty. I'm just going to skip ahead because he's not making any arguments here. That's, a, that's, 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 the, that's, that's, that's like, well, in order to be a part of this geopolitical hegemon, like, you need to have the thing every country has, and no country is even close to not having. Well, yeah, of course, right? Like, yeah. The USSR had a market economy. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's that's, yeah. Um, there's no alternative to that, you know, it's, at all. 
So the Warsaw Soviet Pact. Union had a market, but it did not have a market economy. It had markets, but it didn't have a market economy. With, whenever you're exchanging goods, whenever there's trade, whenever there's money involved and there's circulation of currency and commodities, you're going to have markets in some capacity or another. Like, so again, he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. I got him to admit on stream that he doesn't even know what market what markets are. He he doesn't know anything, dude. Yeah, he he, he himself admits he doesn't read theory. So he doesn't know shit, and people want to look to that point where you know I, I lost my cool and I laughed at him and oh so cringe so cringe. Yeah, no, I'll tell you what's really cringe is a someone who is a self-proclaimed market socialist not being able to provide basic economic definitions for the point of engaging in a debate. He's a fucking idiot. Like, again, why people take this guy seriously is just beyond me. Um, but anyways, what, what was he going to say about the Soviets in Warsaw? What else can I debunk here? Um, there's no alternative to that, you know, it's, it, at all. That's capitalist realism right there, my friends. There is no alternative to the market. It is also, once again, not objectively true. The USSR was a centrally planned economy. The nations of Eastern Europe were all centrally planned economies. And using rational economic planning, they were able to grow their economies linearly for decades, boom-bust free. All while securing full employment, health care, education, housing, food, and basic economic security to their people. Basic economic security that you do not have under capitalism. Bosch wouldn't know anything about that, however, considering he's an obese trust fund baby from Beverly Hills who probably lives in a rich, safe neighborhood and has never known a day of hunger in his life. So the Warsaw Pact was okay because the countries were aligned with the USSR anyway. The concept of countries choosing to enter a defensive alliance uh, with the Soviet Union to protect themselves against invasion is great. Did the countries in the Warsaw Pact all choose? Hey. Are you familiar with your history? Are you familiar with the, uh, with the history of the term tanky when the USSR had to roll in military forces to force countries to stay part of their hegemon? In asinine points, every state exercises authoritarianism to some degree or another, and the degree to which the state has to rely on direct naked force is in proportion to the degree to which that state's ideology is entrenched into the culture as well as to the degree to which the state system is able to buy the social peace. Boss just doesn't see it because nothing that he says or does actually threatens business as usual, and on the contrary, He's a privileged, wealthy white guy who directly reaffirms liberal hegemony, so he's going to be materially rewarded for his speech and advocacy. Here's the truth. The reason why the U.S. and Western Europe didn't have to rely on direct force as much as the Eastern European countries have are for a number of reasons. For one, people are way more directly and overtly manipulated under capitalism, and thus political repression only seems like it's more obvious under socialism because the state is way less prone to lie to you and brainwash you into holding beliefs which are directly against your own best interests. And for two, historically the imperial core, through its exploitation of the world, can afford to buy the social peace with the spoils of its imperialist plunder. Take the 1800s United States settler colonial expansion out westward, for example. Cheap and free land was directly used by the U.S. government as a pressure valve for class antagonism, effectively bribing the white proletariat and petty bourgeoisie into its complicity with genocide. Exhibit B. Look at the rampant activity of socialists and communists in the 1930s during the Great Depression. First, we got FDR. Again, more bribes. And then second, we got a slew of anti-communist legislation, purging socialists and communists from trade unions, positions of public office, as well as the perpetual witch-hunting which transpired in the 1950s Red Scare. My point is that being a wealthy first world nation with a population which directly benefits from settler colonialism and imperialist plunder tends to ramp down the needs for political repression in the direct sense of the term. For more detailed analysis on this subject, I recommend Settlers by Jay Sakai, or An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbart. Back to the first point again. The notion that the United States and Western Europe don't repress the shit out of people and their political enemies is a complete and total lie. There is a long history of intelligence agencies infiltrating, breaking up, arresting, blackmailing, and even assassinating leftist political activists and organizers going back well over a century. 
From Cointel Pro to the multiple Red Scares to Operation Garden Plot, where the U.S. was planning on unleashing the army on dozens of cities to crush civil rights activism, to the direct backing and enabling of Pinochet, the Mujahideen, and dozens of other far-right dictators on our tax dollars, to the mass killings and genocides backed by the CIA, murdering millions of socialists, communists, and labor organizers around the globe. It's amazing to me that Vosch is at the very least nominally aware of these facts, and yet only selectively applies this liberal moralistic standard to Russia and China, while feigning sympathy to North and South American socialism. It's almost like the guy's an Orientalist or something. At the very least, that's the kind of sentiments and implications which you can derive from his rhetoric because I have never seen anybody go to the degrees which he has to shit on these countries as well as socialist projects who hail from them. Like, take the United States, for example. Let's say you see socialism emerge in some U.S. states, and there are U.S. states that are voting to succeed and they're voting to break away. Uh, you know, like, some, like a block of U.S. states, you know. You think America is just going to consensually let that happen? You don't think America is going to roll in with the tanks and roll in with the military to stop that from happening? Like, considering the degree to which the U.S. government has stomped out socialism, like, literally fucking everywhere. So, no, like, no. it's okay when the U.S. government does it. It's okay when fucking uh, America goes around stomping out socialism and just so they can impose capitalism. But then when, like, the Soviets move in to thwart a potential uprising, which could lead to capitalist restoration and create geopolitical holes in their, uh, in their national security, it's a bad thing. No, dude, every state exercises uh, force and authoritarianism to some extent or another. The Soviets needed to do it more because they were not wealthy enough and because socialist psychology was not entrenched enough Socialism actually requires you to have strong leadership. It actually requires you to have ideologically committed political thinkers and bureaucrats and officers and leaders, people that actually care about a cause greater than themselves. That's what it actually requires in order to function. So like when you liberalize and when you give people the ability to just liberalize and do whatever they want, you're by design going to get cynical opportunists that are just going to try to ruin it for everyone so that they themselves can get fucking rich. It's class warfare, my friend. Yeah. And plus the United States, they, they, they did very similar things. Like they didn't do it on the same scale. I mean, like they didn't, you know, literally roll in the tanks or anything like that, but we already know about Operation Gladio. We already know about the United States covertly supporting far right, um, a terrorist in uh, Western Europe during this time. I mean, they yeah. were supporting, like, the United States was supporting fucking Franco, you know, a, a literal fucking fascist who was engaged in something called white terror in his country where he had literal concentration camps and shooting Pinochet. people. And, Pinochet, and Pinochet is another famous one. Uh, the white army, the white guardists in Russia had, like, the universal bl blessing and backing of the Western colonial powers. Uh, but yeah, no, I agree. Defending NATO and upholding and identifying with imperialism and pushing American exceptionalist propaganda to trigger and own the tankies. Exactly what I'm talking about. It, it's funny how anarchists say tankies, not socialist, when they're bourgeois individualists that always side with liberalism. Yeah, it's called, my, that my friend is called projection. It's pure projection. When you hear these fucking anarcho-liberals, like, I kind of differentiate. You have true anarchists, and then you have the anarcho-liberals. Vosh is what I call an anarcho-liberal. Basically, these people have internalized uh, petty bourgeois individualism to such an extent. They can't see the forest for the trees. Anything Bosch says about us not being actual socialists and us being uh, basically against the interests of the proletariat, Anything he says about Marxism, Leninism, or actually existing socialism is pure projection. He knows not what he's talking about. It, by his own admission, he doesn't read books. So, to my knowledge, we have not recently invaded France, though we should, um, to convince them to stay with us. In fact, the U. We didn't need to. Another point that I'd like to make is to note Vosch's underhanded comment slash joke, where he says, "Quote: We didn't invade France." although we should after they left NATO. 
which directly implies that he himself is okay with the use of coercion by the state when it serves his interests. Once again, this outlines his Western chauvinism, hypocrisy, and Orientalism once more. We need NATO to protect us from the big bad evil Russians and Chinese. Second point. France leaving NATO actually caused a great deal of internal strife and strained relations between countries within the alliance, enough to the degree to which it threatened its very existence. Case in point, France leaving NATO threatened the foundations of the institution. Now imagine if multiple countries tried to leave at once, or threatened to leave NATO all at once. That would ramp up the pressure even more so. And given the economic problems and technological lag of the communist world behind the imperialist West, given the multiple instances where this exact same thing was being threatened behind the Iron Curtain, do you now see why the Soviets were poised to do as they did? We didn't need to because they're so economically entangled and entrenched with our businesses and they're still aligned with us. We don't need to worry about France defecting and going socialist because they're fucking not. The issue is like the the, the socialist countries, Warsaw, weren't as wealthy. They couldn't buy off the social peace with the spoils of imperialism like the Western countries could. And they didn't really have enough time to completely embed and entrench themselves. And in the end, they ultimately got betrayed from above by their own weak leadership that ended up capitulating to the pressure. UK had their Brexit. They left the EU and they were allowed to. It was a stupid decision. I disagree with it. I think it was dumb, but they were allowed to. But yeah, if it was the countries of Eastern Europe and they autonomously, autonomously made the choice to, to join up with, um, with uh, the USSR and what have you, this is the reason why. And this is the reason why so many leftists online are pro-imperialism as long as it's not being done by the US, okay? They need to- you don't know what imperialism is. Like, that's such a loaded statement. Like, the, the bourgeoisie, the capitalist powers of the world the dominant predominant capitalist powers of the world are constantly trying to impose capitalism wherever they go so the socialist bloc and the socialist bloc countries should be willing to do the same thing and no it wasn't fucking imperialism it's not imperialism when you directly subsidize the developments of other countries and help them develop their own independent self-sufficient economies so that they actually can stand up on their own two feet and have some fucking dignity for themselves. So, yeah, again, he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. He's economically and politically and historically illiterate. And for whatever reason, people treat this guy like he's an expert just because he's got a deep voice and he's good at talking. To downplay imperialism when it's done by their side, so they overstate imperialism when it's being done by the West. For instance, It's not overstating when you point to the obvious facts that America and Western Europe have done more irreparable damage to the world and have directly had a hand to play in the stomping out of socialism everywhere and anywhere that such movements have emerged. It's not an overstatement to point out the fact that the United States has backed numerous genocides, has partook in and is continuing to partake in genocides as we speak. If anybody is downplaying or underestimating the amount of damage that one side's imperialism has done to the world, it is Bosch and Bosch alone. Even as modern rival imperialist powers, Russia and China aren't guilty of anything resembling the kind of widespread depravity and inhumanity which the U.S. and Western colonial powers have and continue to do. Of the top ten bloodiest regimes in history, Russia and China don't even rank on the top ten list. And this piece of shit Bosch is going to sit here and say that we're the ones downplaying imperialism. Fuck you. They claim that 2014 in Ukraine, you know, the ousting of their leader was some kind of pro-Western coup. They talk about it like it was a pro-Western Nazi coup, like we literally installed a government. Now this... No, but we, I mean, we definitely had backing and support. I don't understand how this guy can recognize how the coup in Bolivia, like he's super sympathetic to South American leftists. I don't understand how he can be super sympathetic to Bolivia and nuanced and understanding. Like he understands that Janine Inez was definitely a CIA plant, definitely a a psyop of some sorts. Like he can, he fully believes and understands the role historically the CIA has played in regime change. He understands it when it's Bolivia uh, and, and Evo Morales. But when it comes to Ukraine, all of a sudden, it's hard for you to believe that the pro-Russian regime was just conveniently ousted and replaced by a pro-NATO regime? As I stated before, this is bizarre to me. 
He understands and acknowledges the deep history of CIA fuckery and regime change in Latin America, and yet he just conveniently ignores it when it's being done in Eastern Europe. Why? It's, it, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have a problem with Vosh if it wasn't for the fact that he had hundreds of thousands of subscribers. If, if, yeah. if, if, I wouldn't even, I don't necessarily even have a problem with this guy being a bad takes factory and uh, who in, actively and spreads imperialist uh, anti-communist Cold War propaganda constantly while reaffirming liberal hegemony. It's the fact that he does this while claiming to be a socialist. And, and it, he does this while claiming to be a socialist while having the subscriber count that he does. So to such a perverse extent, he is just poisoning the discourse, creating so much confusion and creating this fucking spawning an entire generation of what I call basically social neoliberals. Like, that's what it is. He's creating a whole generation of social neoliberals, social Democrats, social fascists, people who are like left of center, but committed, ideologically committed anti-communists. And yep. it's absolutely fucking cursed. And pro-imperialist. This is objectively, factually not the case. It's very plain to see this is objectively not the case. We had a guy on who tried to defend that point and it went really, 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 really poorly for him. Uh, no one will ever be able to defend that point in a straight up conversation. It's not possible to because it's not true. Um, but they have to pretend that's the case because they want us to be the monsters that they justify and defend. We, we need to be that bad in order for their propaganda on their side to work. Now, hey. Wow, speak for yourself. Like, dude, it, it's funny. Like if you swapped uh, the Warsaw and socialist countries for US and EU and vice versa, that would actually be a way more apt description. Um, so guys, let's go. I got a little PDF for you guys. Triumph of evil. So here's the list of atrocities uh, and genocides committed by the United States. And this isn't even a complete list. But yeah, India, Filipino, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Iraq, other. Um, not counting the millions of people who are starved and killed by preventable illness due to our fucking sanctions. We've got 11 million minimum. Soviet Union has not done anything like this. I mean, yeah, people can point to like Afghanistan. And I mean, a lot of innocent people died, but they didn't kill millions of people in Afghanistan. No, not, not even close. And they haven't engaged in anything resembling just like this deliberate uh, bl blanket systematic exterminations of peoples. Like, are you fucking kidding me? The Soviets weren't the one raping and pillaging the world. They were trying to help build it up. They were trying to help save it. So yeah, read Triumph of Evil from this segment. Um, if you take like the top 10 most bloody regimes in history, Russia and China don't even come within the top 10 ranking. Like, honestly, they don't. Like, really, it's really America, Britain, France, Germany, and Spain. It, those are pretty much like the top five. And then the rest of them aren't even fucking, the, the rest of them aren't even communist regimes. They're all capitalist regimes. Like, 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 dude, how are you going to fucking sit here and look at freedom fighters like Ho Chi Minh? Look at freedom fighters like Ho Chi Minh or uh, Kim Il-sung or or uh, Fidel Castro. I don't understand like how you're going to look to figures like this. And you're going to say, like, the Soviets are backing, are uh, committing atrocities and crimes and crimes against humanity. When you consider that the opposite end of it was like the evil reactionary side that was basically feeding all of their people to the grinder so that only like two to three percent of the uh, indigenous population could benefit from imperialism, these comprador capitalists. It's so crazy to me. This either demonstrates a massive amount of ignorance on his end, or or he's just being a propagandist. He's literally like deliberately being a propagandist. Um, maybe he is ideologically committed or genuinely convinced that the, uh, that the Soviet Union was what it was. But the thing is, people have tried to come on and explain that it wasn't that bad. I have tried to come on and explain it wasn't that bad. And they actually saved a great deal of lives and did a great deal of good for the world. I kept trying to explain this. And you wanna know what he did? He's just like, oh, oh, I wouldn't talk about saving the world from fascism. They almost joined the fascists and made this loaded fucking argument about the Soviet Axis talks or the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which is 
totally it doesn't even fucking prove the point he was trying to make yeah yeah i i think he's just a fool propagandist honestly if you want me to be quite frank yeah on, at this point i just think someone's fucking paying him like maybe i don't maybe not well actually he is being paid he's being yeah. paid by all of his dumbass subscribers but i think someone else is probably paying him so because i mean this i mean no wonder why he's so adamantly against communism he's a multi-millionaire He's basically a member of the ruling class. Like, of course, yeah. he's going to be adamantly aligned the in, against the interests of the global proletariat. But yeah, no, Soviets, if you actually look at their record and compare it to the U.S. and NATO, Soviets aren't guilty of anything, even fucking touching the Western imperial powers. Like, not even close. Not even close. Yeah. Hey, listen. If you care about American imperialism, if you think American imperialism is so bad, why not talk about the times that it actually happens instead of making shit up, right? Like, why not? We do talk about it, but then you fucking downplay it or disregard it. Like, you brought up two examples of NATO imperialism and just blew them off. It's like just not being that big of a deal. Yeah. They're like, dude, or, or, like, or, the, or, the, or, like, or they're necessary. Yeah. Like, this is what pisses me off about liberals. They will always condemn something in the abstract, like previous acts of imperialist aggression. In, in like previous acts of U.S. fuckery and meddling that have literally resulted in the deaths and immiseration and displacements of quite literally tens of millions of people. They'll always say it's bad in the abstract and say that these things were always bad. Like, but this time it'll be different, right? If we just get involved here, if we do this there, if we participate in a regime change here, if we do some sanctions there, Bosch is getting his wishes, man. And the Russian people are going to suffer for it because of those sanctions. Bosch is getting his wishes. He's getting his genocidal sanctions, which are probably going to be placed on Russia. So, like, he's just a piece of shit. Like, why do why does anyone think this guy is left wing or take him seriously at all? Like, fucking seriously, dude. Not focus on the stuff we actually do. Our support of Saudi Arabia and um, and Israel are monstrous and indefensible. Um, frankly, the fact that we are so buddy buddy with China, in spite of all the shit they do, is also pretty suspect. Uh there he goes again, implying that us being on anything resembling friendly relations with another world power is a bad thing. Again, xenophobic Orientalist sentiments. China bad. Yellow man bad. You know, but they wouldn't agree with that, right? All the shit we've done in Latin America, all the shit we've done in Central America, um, all the shit that we've done, uh, you know, our, 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 our unwillingness to engage in proper, you know, um, economic, uh, non-conditional investment in Africa, the fact that we still back the IMF and the World Bank and let them ruin developing countries so they're amenable to American business interests. If you care about American imperialism, which you should. Okay, so all that is fucking about true. But you're still supporting the military apparatus of fucking yeah, imperialism. Like, like, so how like, does that work? Like, like, he's still supporting NATO. Let me explain his mindset. This is the mindset of a liberal, right? He's not tackling this from the position that these things are systematically, institutionally bad, but it's not actually because it's an inherent aspect of imperialism. It's because it's being mismanaged. It's not imperialism done right. It's not a good war. It's not a good intervention. It, it's it's not a proper uh, U.S. intervention. It's not a good war. He He's coming at this from the mindset of, yeah, all those previous actions are bad and these actions are bad, but we need to reform the system. We need to make better imperialism or more friendly foreign policy. We need to reform it so that it's more tenable. It's not as morally, it, it doesn't hurt our moral sensibilities as much. Uh, we can reform it. But the point is, is that there is no reforming it. Um, and he analyzes it from the mindset that it's just incompetence. Like the imperialists are just incompetent. Like they don't know what they're doing. Like that they're incompetent. We're just the big jum jumbo lumbering empire. This is the analysis Chomsky gives that America is just a lumbering empire that doesn't know what it's doing, but it actually means well. It doesn't mean to, you know, do a little genocidal sanctions there a little carpet bombing there, a little economic restructuring here, no, or a little coup here and there. No, it, it's, it, it always means well. It, 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 it always means well. Okay, so did fucking Hitler, dude. So in that regard, 
he, again, he's tackling it from the mindset of a reformist. Like he wants to reform it and make it better. He's tackling it from the mindset where he is identifying with the state apparatus in the US and NATO. Like he's not tackling it from the mindset of a revolutionary where really you should be looking to smash these things and replace them with a new regime uh, based on a new set of socialist proletarian values. No. So that, that's the mindset of the liberal. That is the mindset of Bosch. They will always condemn things bad in the abstract. They will always condemn past actions of aggression in the abstract. And then because they identify with imperialism in the current system, they'll, they'll take the interpretation, the naive interpretation that they can reform it and make it better. And that, uh, oh, though what our government does is bad, even though like what we do is monstrously objectively evil, um, this therefore uh, justifies us taking a magnifying glass and looking at the bad actions and, you know, misconduct of other governments and other regimes, putting a magnifying glass over it, analyzing it, and then blowing it up way, way, way bigger so that they can try to put it on equal moral footing to condemn that other government and make them out to be just as, if not more evil, or just as a bigger threat to the world as uh, the United States. It's this equalizing they do. It is the liberal moral equalizing, which is done so that A, they can provide ideological justification for present acts of aggression as to concern troll for regime change and or demonize rival imperialist powers, and B, downplay their own state's atrocities and crimes against humanity as to trick and manipulate people into thinking these actions are justified. Mark my words, if this were the year 2002, Bosch would be one of the many idiots who were on board with the Iraq War. In fact, I'd be willing to bet my top dollar that no matter how far back you go, using Bosch's logic and framework, you could find all sorts of U.S. interventions and military adventurism justifiable because we need to stop the Reds. We need to stop these evil Russians and Chinese. Vodka, bad. Yellow man, bad. If we were living in the 80s, Bosch would be a supporter of the Mujahideen freedom fighters. If this were the 1970s, he'd be supporting the Pinochet dictatorship or the South Vietnamese dictatorship. You know, whatever. It is what it is. It's basically like a pot calling the kettle black, more or less. Um, it's equalizing. That way they can justify selectively supporting regime change, selectively supporting uh, interventions and wars and sanctions here and there. This is, um, this is an imperialist, people. This is the mindset of an imperialist. And with that being said, I'm done. I'm done with Bosch. Let's move on. It's imperial management, basically. That's what he wants. He wants imperial management. And when you were talking, I was thinking to the Bernie Sanders 2016 and 2020 campaign. Bernie Sanders would have been great for U.S. imperialism. He would have kept this shit going a lot longer than it probably would last. But, you know, the, the, the ruling class just doesn't want to give up even a little bit. Like they will literally just, they will uh, go out of their way to um, even sabotage their own interest uh, just for the short-term profits.